There is a biological secret flowing through human veins that most people never think about. Doctors don't talk about it publicly. Blood banks track it quietly. And evolution never designed it to protect anyone. It's carried by only about 6.8% of humanity. Yet, in an emergency, anyone can end up depending on it. This blood breaks the normal rules of compatibility. Under natural conditions, it can kill unborn children. For thousands of years, it caused repeated pregnancy loss. By basic evolutionary logic, it should have faded out of the human population long ago. Instead, modern trauma centers cannot function without it. Every day, patients arrive unconscious and bleeding. No name, no records, no blood type. Doctors have minutes to act. One wrong transfusion, and the immune system becomes lethal. So, they reach for it. O negative blood. Here's what makes this genuinely disturbing. The same blood type that once carried a biological cost is now treated as a strategic resource. Supplies are thin. Units expire in 42 days. Entire city reserves have vanished in hours during mass emergencies. This isn't a miracle bloodline. It's a genetic liability that civilization quietly turned into a last line of defense. And once you understand how that happened, the idea of human safety stops feeling as solid as we like to believe. If you search for universal donor blood, you'll see the same explanation repeated everywhere. O negative is rare because it's special. Evolution kept it as a backup. A biological failsafe for emergencies. That explanation sounds neat. It's also wrong. There is no universal donor gene. No protected bloodline hiding in our DNA. What modern medicine depends on exists only because two independent genetic systems fail to mark identity at the same time. That isn't design. That isn't intention. It's coincidence surviving pressure. One system controls the molecular flags on red blood cells. These flags act like ID cards. Your immune system checks them constantly. Anything unfamiliar is treated as a threat. The second system controls whether another trigger is present at all. When it is, transfusing the wrong blood can be fatal within minutes. When it isn't, the immune response hesitates. Most people inherit at least one identity marker, and that trigger. A very small fraction inherit neither. That overlap is what hospitals rely on. But here's what makes this genuinely disturbing. This absence doesn't make the blood powerful. It makes it temporarily invisible. Invisible just long enough for doctors to act before the immune system realizes something is wrong. And if this already feels unsettling, pause for a second. Do you actually know your blood type? Most people don't. And in an emergency, that answer isn't academic. It decides how doctors act when you can't speak for yourself. Because here's the part almost no one talks about. Remove trauma centers. Remove emergency medicine. Remove mass transfusions. This blood type loses almost all of its value. For more than 99% of human history, no one knew it existed. It didn't protect populations. It didn't prevent collapse. It didn't save civilizations. It wasn't preserved because it helped humanity survive. It survived despite being dangerous. Which raises a question biology never answered. If nature wasn't protecting this blood type, why didn't it disappear? Here's where the story becomes structurally unstable. The blood type modern hospitals depend on isn't a single trait. It's the overlap of two separate genetic systems that were never meant to line up consistently across generations. They don't travel together. They don't reinforce each other. They don't protect their own survival. One system controls the identity markers on red blood cells. If those markers don't match, the immune response is immediate and violent. The second system controls a different switch. When it's present, transfusing the wrong blood can trigger a rapid, lethal reaction. When it's absent, the response is delayed just long enough for intervention. Most people inherit at least one identity marker, and that switch. Only a small fraction inherit neither. From a genetic standpoint, that overlap is fragile. It doesn't spread efficiently. It doesn't compound. It can vanish in a single generation if inheritance doesn't line up. By evolutionary logic, it should be fading. Instead, modern medicine treats it as indispensable. Blood banks track it obsessively. Units are counted daily. Some hospitals restrict its use so tightly that doctors must justify every transfusion. Because once it's gone, there is no fallback. 
And this is where the story stops being neutral. For most of human history, biology wasn't indifferent to this combination. It wasn't neutral. It was hostile. This blood type didn't just fail to help survival. For thousands of years, it actively worked against it. And the price wasn't paid in disasters or wars. It was paid somewhere far quieter. For most of human history, this blood type didn't reveal itself in disasters. It revealed itself quietly. When a mother lacked a specific blood marker, and her baby inherited it from the father, her immune system sometimes made a fatal mistake. It learned to see the baby's blood as foreign. Not immediately. The first pregnancy often survived. The immune system hadn't learned the pattern yet. But the body remembers. By the second or third pregnancy, antibodies crossed the placenta and began destroying the baby's red blood cells before birth. Oxygen levels collapsed. Organs failed. Brain damage followed. There were no fevers. No visible illness. No explanation. Just babies who stopped moving. Imagine watching your children die one by one from something you cannot see. No infection, no injury, no curse. Just your own immune system doing exactly what it evolved to do. Entire families notice the pattern. The same women losing children again and again. Healthy mothers. Normal pregnancies. Loss that followed bloodlines silently. Before modern medicine, this incompatibility accounted for a devastating number of late-term losses and newborn deaths. In some families, half of all children never survived infancy. By every rule of evolution, this should have ended the story. Traits that reduce successful reproduction don't persist for tens of thousands of years. They disappear. This one didn't. And before we go further, pause for a moment. If you've ever heard family stories about repeated miscarriages, stillbirths, or babies who didn't survive without a clear explanation, you're not alone. Many people only learn why decades later. If that's something you or your family has experienced, share it in the comments. These stories are more common than most people realize. Because what finally stopped this wasn't evolution adapting. It was something far more sudden. One injection changed the outcome of something biology had enforced for tens of thousands of years. In 1968, that injection was introduced. The drug was called Rogam. It didn't alter DNA. It didn't remove the blood type. It did something far more disruptive. It stopped the immune system from learning the wrong lesson. For the first time in human history, a mother's body could be prevented from forming the antibodies that would attack future pregnancies. The chain reaction never began. The damage never came. Within a decade, what had once been a hidden, generational death sentence became a routine prenatal shot. Quiet, standard, almost invisible sit with that. For thousands of years, this blood type carried a reproductive penalty. Then, in less than 10 years, that penalty disappeared. Not slowly. Not through natural selection. Instantly. Evolution never had time to respond. And this is where the story becomes dangerous. When a biological cost vanishes overnight, traits that once struggled to survive are suddenly released from pressure. They don't surge forward. They simply stop being filtered out. All the disadvantages were gone but the situational advantages were still there. And the timing could not have been worse, because humanity was entering an age defined by speed. Cars, factories, air travel, dense cities, mechanized war. Injuries began moving faster than diagnosis. Emergencies grew larger than preparation. Medicine didn't just save lives. It changed the balance. A rare genetic combination was suddenly free to persist right as civilization created massive demand for it. No one planned this. No one predicted it. But once the rules broke, there was no going back. Once the reproductive cost was removed, researchers began noticing something uncomfortable. This blood type didn't just matter during transfusions. In certain diseases, it quietly shifted survival odds. Not dramatically. Not heroically. In margins. Some pathogens rely on specific blood markers to do their worst damage. They use them to bind red blood cells together, clog small vessels, and starve tissues of oxygen. When those markers are missing, the mechanism weakens. In severe malaria outbreaks, people with this blood group were less likely to suffer the deadliest complications. Infection still occurred, fever still came, but the process that killed fastest struggled. That sounds like protection. 
until you see the other side. During cholera outbreaks, people with this same blood group faced much higher risk. Dehydration accelerated. Hospitalization rates climbed. What reduced harm in one epidemic magnified it in another. This is where the story becomes uncomfortable. There is no safe blood type. No universal advantage. Only trade-offs. And most of the time, those trade-offs don't matter. Not when healthcare exists. Not when outbreaks are small. Not when risk is spread out over decades. They matter when societies compress danger. When millions share water systems, transportation, hospitals, when infections move faster than response. If you've ever wondered why the same disease can hit people so differently, even in the same family, this is part of the answer. And if you've seen that firsthand, different outcomes, same exposure, you're not imagining it. Biology is quietly picking sides long before symptoms appear. Blood type alone isn't destiny, but under pressure, it can start nudging the odds. And beneath even that, there's another layer most people never learn exists. Blood type feels definitive, like a label that settles the question of risk. It doesn't. There is another genetic switch that quietly decides how certain viruses interact with your body, and most people don't know it exists. It controls whether blood group markers appear only in your bloodstream or also coat the surfaces of your gut and respiratory tract. Some people express those markers everywhere. Others don't. That single difference can determine whether a virus attaches easily or struggles to infect at all. Doctors noticed this long before they understood it. During outbreaks of stomach viruses, entire households would collapse within hours. Same food, same water, same exposure. Except one person. That person wasn't immune. They weren't healthier. They weren't luckier. Their biology simply didn't give the virus what it needed. Two people can share the same blood type and still face completely different outcomes because of this hidden gene. One ends up hospitalized. The other never shows symptoms. This is where the story becomes unsettling. The factors that shape survival are often invisible. You don't feel them. You don't know you have them. They only reveal themselves when something goes wrong. Blood type isn't a verdict. It's one layer in a stack of probabilities that only become visible under pressure. And modern civilization applies pressure at scale. If you expect this blood type to be evenly distributed, the global map looks wrong. Instead of smooth gradients, you see spikes. Specific regions where this blood type appears far more often than global averages. Isolated valleys. Mountain communities. Coastal populations that stayed inward looking for centuries. This is where myths creep in. Ancient bloodlines. Hidden ancestry. The real explanation is colder. When populations remain isolated, genetics stops averaging out. Rare traits aren't diluted by migration. They linger. Sometimes they become common purely by chance. This is genetic drift. It doesn't reward usefulness. It doesn't punish danger. It preserves accidents. If a small founding population happened to carry a rare blood trait, that trait can dominate centuries later. Marriages happen within the group. Variants reinforce themselves. What should have faded becomes normal. This is how quirks survive without helping anyone. And when those isolated patterns collide with modern medicine, the consequences aren't theoretical. Hospitals don't care how a trait spread. Blood banks don't care why a region has higher frequencies. They only care that the trait exists. And that everywhere else, it's scarce. In today's hospitals, this blood type is valuable for one reason. Emergencies don't wait. When a patient arrives unconscious and bleeding, Doctors don't have the luxury of precision. Blood typing takes time. Sometimes those minutes don't exist. So medicine defaults to the safest option when information is missing. That default became a dependency. And dependencies break systems. In 2017, after the Las Vegas mass shooting, the city's entire supply of this blood type was gone in six hours. Not low. Gone. Emergency shipments had to be rushed in from surrounding states just to keep operating rooms open. That wasn't a freak event. It was a stress test. Every major hospital is one mass casualty incident away from zero. Not from running low. From having none left. That reality has forced quiet changes. Protocols rewritten behind the scenes. In certain emergencies, doctors now avoid using this blood unless there is absolutely no alternative. 
The universal donor has become a strategic reserve. Locked away. Counted carefully. Protected not by myth but by policy. Modern medicine didn't discover a miracle. It built a world that cannot function without one fragile combination. Here's the part that makes this dependency genuinely dangerous. Blood expires. Every unit comes with a printed date. A countdown timer. About 42 days. And then it's useless. Not weaker. Not less effective. Worthless. Someone's lifeline. Expired on a shelf. That forces hospitals into a constant gamble. They're not storing blood for emergencies that already happened. They're betting on emergencies that haven't happened yet. Car crashes. Factory accidents. Natural disasters. Mass violence. Store too little, and people bleed to death waiting. Store too much, and it quietly expires. There is no safe buffer. When something big happens, the balance collapses instantly. Supplies meant to last days vanish in hours. Regional reserves are drained. Blood is flown across state lines under emergency escort. Most people never see this panic, but it affects you. If you were in a serious accident right now, your survival odds would depend on whether someone donated blood this week, not this month, this week. That's how thin the margin is. And when the system begins to fail, the same blood type absorbs the shock first, because it isn't used for routine care. It's saved for chaos. Faced with this fragility, science has tried to bypass the problem. Researchers have learned how to strip identifying markers from donated red blood cells. Others have grown red blood cells from stem cells, hoping to manufacture compatible blood without relying on donors. On paper, it looks like the end of scarcity. In reality, it isn't close. Producing enough lab-grown blood for one patient is already expensive and slow. Producing enough for a hospital, a city, or a country remains wildly impractical. And even if the technology improves, another problem remains. Blood doesn't exist in isolation. It must be collected, tested, stored, transported, tracked, and delivered under pressure. Technology can replicate cells, but it cannot replace the human systems that make transfusions possible. For now, there is no synthetic escape hatch. The universal donor hasn't been replaced. It's been exposed. This isn't a story about destiny or forbidden bloodlines. It's a story about how survival actually works now. A genetic accident became invaluable only because we built systems that move faster than certainty. Emergency medicine didn't uncover a miracle hiding in our DNA. It created a dependency. Somewhere right now, blood is flowing from one stranger into another. No names. No shared history. Just timing, compatibility, and a decision made under pressure. Before you go, two things. First, check your blood type. Most people don't know it. Second, if you want more stories where biology, history, and survival collide in ways that actually matter, subscribe to Stone and Bone. And let me ask you something. Do you know your blood type? Are you O negative? Have you ever donated or needed a transfusion? Drop it in the comments. Because survival isn't abstract. It's shared.